All right, we here at Church Middleton are proud once again and happy to have George Newmeyer, the investigative reporter extraordinaire, uh, who uncovers everything, kind of heads up the curve a little bit. You're, you're always ahead of the curve, George, in everything you do, right? Well, I, I try to be. I try to report what nobody else is reporting, and, and I pursue stories without, uh, I'd like to think, without fear or favor, and I'm not... Uh, you know, I'm basically independent, so I don't have uh, any masters who tell me what I can and can't report. Uh, so, and I use social media as a as an outlet for my reporting. And as you know, you know, there are no publishers on social media. You know, we're our own publishers, and so we have to make the editorial calls. And I I feel that in order to uh, advance a story, one has to be willing to report what one is learning, even if that's very controversial, even if that's going to generate huge backlash and and, uh, and uh, hurt a lot of uh, feelings, quote unquote, I, I still think that that has to be reported. I, I, I believe that sunlight is the best disinfectant, and I think independent media provides the most sunlight. Absolutely, especially in the Catholic world where there is kind of a conspiracy of silence and cover up and, you know, neglect and, you know, all of that. We've gone into that lots of times, but... Uh, you know, you have uh, sort of blazed the way, you might say, on the stories involving Cardinal Whirl uh, in D.C. and all the corruption surrounding him and everything else. You got absolutely just torn apart by the Catholic establishment media for reporting those things, you know, it's sort of out front as well as behind the scenes. Uh, but then you came along, came back. It turns out everything you said was right. Uh, and then you come along and start reporting on Monsignor Rossi, Walter Rossi, the rector of the uh, National Basilica of the Immaculate Conception. And over a year ago, you were reporting that. We were working together on that. You did, obviously, the yeoman's work, and we were happy to you know, be a vehicle to, for you to get your reporting out uh, here at Church Milton. Then, here we are a year later, and I'm just going to say, George, do a happy dance. Do a victory lap, because everything you said was right. Well, you know, I think we have, we have Vigano, Archbishop Vigano, to thank, I think, for breaking open the Rossi story. When he corroborated what I had reported last year, without compare. that really changed the soul of that story and put a lot of pressure on the uh, Archbishop of Washington to take a look at this matter. As long as it was confined, as long as the story was confined to the, you know, so-called margins of Catholic journalism with, uh, you know, uh, reports like mine, it was it was possible for the establishment uh, Catholic world to ignore the Rossi scandal. But once uh, Vigano came along and he said, uh, read the articles in the American Spectator about Walter Rossi. Those articles are true. They correspond to my experience as a papal nuncio. He said that as papal nuncio, he received documentation indicating that Rossi had preyed on students at Catholic universities the trajectory of the story and it really put pressure on the bishops to finally investigate this matter. It took a while. I mean, it took three three months or so after the Vigano disclosure for them to pull the trigger. But uh, what we in the internet, in independent media did, and then Vigano backing up what we did, that really laid the groundwork for what's happening right now. And now we have basically, uh, I've heard I've heard from sources that a former FBI agent named George Ald, A-U-L-D, is investigating the Rossi uh, scandal uh, for a law firm representing the Scranton Diocese. And apparently this guy is, um, you know, I, 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 I'd like to think he's taking the, uh, the matter seriously. I've heard from various people that they've been contacted. He, has, he of course, hasn't contacted me. Uh, you know, the day that he contacts me is the day that I'll be certain that this is a uh, above-board yeah. investigation. And, I, and I, I would just say to him right now that he can contact me anytime, day or night, and I'd be happy to supply him with letters and, and other documentation uh, um, establishing all, all of the reporting that I did for the for yeah. matter. But at any rate, um, that's what's going on, and we need an independent media. We've got to keep uh, 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 their feet to the fire. We've got to keep George Ald's feet to the fire, this investigator for the law firm. Uh, we've got to keep uh, Ben Barra's feet to the fire. Obviously, he's doing this in part because he wants... Philadelphia. He wants the uh, red hat in Philadelphia. He wants to succeed Shafu, and he knows that if he doesn't at least show a semblance of transparency regarding Rossi, he's not, you know, he may not get Philadelphia. So, uh, and also Ben Barra has compromised himself. That's something that people don't know, is that Ben Barra has been the subject 
of serious rumors himself. And so he's, Many of you are aware I think, trying to throw people off the scent, as it were, by investigating Rossi. Uh, that, that shows that, you know, he's, he's taking these gay, gay uh, predatory stories seriously. I'm not claiming that, that Bambera is the subject of accusations of gay predation, but I am saying that he is the subject of uh, allegations of being compromised. And, um, and I won't specify how. But I do know that Bambera is, uh, you know, he, he's an, an allegedly compromised figure. And that's one of the reasons why he has been so protective of the gay mafia in Scranton. And that's why he bring in a guy like James Martin, you know, that prop, uh, LGBT propagandist James Martin, Father Martin, to come into Scranton a couple of times. And, um, you know, there's a reason why these things happen, as you know. And uh, so sure. I'll put it that there is a, uh, uh, a a sense of throwing the cloak over everything because, yeah, I mean, look when when Archbishop Vigano labeled it uh, in one of his later testimonies the corrupt gay mafia. Uh, I mean that that's just to sort of weigh that in your mind as a Catholic, as just a faithful Catholic, just goes to mass every Sunday and you know, has your devotional life and all of that, just working on your own salvation. To stop and ponder that for a moment is, it's horrendous that the leadership of the church, not every single bishop, obviously, but a vast majority of people who run the day-to-day -day operations of the church are somehow connected to a corrupt gay mafia. They're either, you know, straight and protecting their own careers or don't want to, you know, uh, you know, blow the lid off something that will somehow devolve back to them and get them kicked out or punished or whatever. Talk to us about that for a little bit, because I still think there's a huge number of Catholics, regular lay Catholics, who just don't want to accept that this is real. Oh, absolutely. And it goes to the very, very top of the church. And just take a look at Kevin Farrell, Cardinal Kevin Farrell. He is, as far as I know, and you probably have, have similar, uh, have heard similar stories, but Farrell has been the subject of allegations of gay misconduct as a, uh, a bishop who has allegedly made advances upon, um, at least in, well, in one case, a priest. And I know that he's been investigated uh, by his own fellow Texas bishops uh, with respect to that matter. And yet, what what is the job that Kevin Cardinal Farrell has been given? Camera lingo. He's the, which is a fancy title for the guy who's going to be overseeing the papal interregnum. He's going to be the guy, he's going to be one of the major players in determining who the next pope is. And this is a guy mm -hmm. who is a bona fide member of the gay mafia. He has all these, um, he, uh, he's connected to, to Theodore McCarrick. He lived with Theodore McCarrick for five years. He's connected to Maciel. Uh, in both cases, he claimed total ignorance of their misconduct, which is, doesn't pass the laugh test. And, uh, no. and yet, you know, this guy is, um, he'll be a major player at the next conclave, he'll be overseeing the papal interregnum, and we very well, because of guys like Farrell, we may end up with a yet another pope who's the prisoner of the gay mafia and and who's a, an enabler of the gay mafia or or a captive of the gay mafia, and um, yeah. or or even a full blown participant in the gay mafia. You know, that's that's a possibility too. Is that the gay mafia? We may end up with a just a, a an explicitly gay pope at at some point if the if the liberal trajectory of the church uh, remains the same. Yeah, it's, it's, it's frightening as we think about this. Now, let's switch gears here. You're coming to us from uh, Buenos Aires. You've been down there reporting on something, uh, speaking of the, the Vatican and the Pope, <laughs> uh, specifically related to the Pope. That's one of the reasons that people are wondering why the transmission is a little scratchy. It's because you're coming from your hotel room there in Buenos Aires. Uh, tell us what you're doing down there and how it relates specifically to Pope Francis. Yeah, I, I was, uh, you know, a Catholic donor, Catholic philanthropist, uh, bought me a plane ticket and basically said, go down to Buenos Aires and uh, see what you can find out about uh, Jorge Bergoglio, because very few reporters have actually done this. Very few reporters have come down here and walked the streets of Buenos Aires and talked to people about Jorge Bergoglio. And so the whole idea of my coming down here, and I've only been down here about a week and a half, and I'm leaving in a few days, is uh, just to... to see if I can hear the open secrets, basically, about Jorge Bergoglio and, and, and learn as much as I possibly can about his background and how he conducted himself as Archbishop of Buenos Aires 
And I'm also getting a chance to look at the condition of Catholicism in Buenos Aires, which is truly awful. I mean, Buenos Aires is a uh, decadent as hell, socially liberal city with very little real Catholic influence over it anymore. I mean, the Catholicism here is almost purely decorative. You know, you'll see cab drivers will have, maybe they'll use rosaries as a form of decoration in their cabs. And, and you know, you'll see Catholic things all over the place, but they've, they've, all those things have been drained of their meaning. And Jorge Bergoglio, unfortunately, is, is one of the bishops responsible for um, the sorry state of Catholicism in this country. I mean, I, I went to, uh, I was just talking to a student at the, the Catholic University in Buenos Aires, which, as you recall, I, Bergoglio uh, sent Victor Fernandez, the author of The Art of Kissing and other outrageous books, he made that guy, I believe, the dean of that school. Well, this kid was telling me today, he said, um, he said, he said, if it's possible, UCA, which is uh, the, the school down here, is even less Catholic than Boston College, which he also went to. And he said, wow, just, that's, a, that's, that's a stunning yeah, I mean, statement. That, yeah, that's a difficult competition to win. And, and yet, Bergoglio, a school that Bergoglio uh, massively shaped, wins that category. It's like the Catholicism there is dead. And there's zero, absolutely zero Catholic evangel evangelization going on down here. Uh, I'm surprised that the Protestants have, haven't made more inroads as they have in Brazil. But you know, te nominally or technically, the population here is 90% Catholic. But what I've heard is that, as this one guy said to me, um, he said 10% of the Catholic uh, of, of the population practices their faith. And then, and then when this guy was asked, uh, well. What does what practicing your faith mean? He says, oh, that 10% that goes to church maybe once or twice a month. So if you actually drill down and you looked at the people who follow all the teachings of the church and go to Mass every Sunday and on Holy Days, I would guess in Buenos Aires and in Argentina at large, it's probably around 5%, maybe, if that. Right. And uh, But, yeah. you know, all you have to do is walk around Buenos Aires and, and, and see how politicized and relativized and empty the faith is to know what a terrible choice Jorge Bergoglio was for uh, the papacy. He, he had no credentials. He had no uh, record that uh, commended him for such an important position. He, uh, he was a terrible Archbishop of Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires, you know, the, the, the Catholic Church is a basket case in Buenos Aires, and it's largely due to the poor leadership and, the, and the fr frankly, the heterodoxy and the, all the scandals permitted by Jorge Bergoglio. Uh how long was Bergoglio Archbishop in Buenos Aires? I'm guessing it was less than a decade, but it was, you know, almost a decade, probably eight or eight years or so. Uh, the guy before him probably wasn't that great either. But what I've heard is that um, the seminary, you know, at the year that Bergoglio was made pope, the seminary was like a ghost town. It was producing very few priests, very few vocations. Uh, when he started. I think when he started, there were maybe 50 priests are, uh, ordained that year. When he left, there might have been five priests, maybe maybe a few more than that, uh, who were ordained, five to ten maybe. And so, you know, he there's just absolutely no evidence that of any pastoral effectiveness by this uh, by Jorge Bergoglio, even though he talks about pastoral activity all the time. He's always talking about how the church has to be pastoral, but where's the evidence that that pastoral activity has ever produced an actual flock? I mean, isn't that the point of pastoral activity to increase the flock, to guard the flock, to expand the flock, you know, and to, and to find, find shepherds for the flock? Well, that didn't happen under our Bishop Bergoglio uh, in Buenos Aires. Uh, sacramental use plummeted, mass attendance plummeted, uh, vocations to climb uh, like marriage is, is non-existent practically people just live together as this pope is as as endorsed one time he even said um, one of the most insane things this pope said was he said i think people, and, and then in the same breath he suggested that most sacramental marriages aren't even real that they, they're not even valid and so in other words cohabitation confers real grace upon you but getting the sacrament doesn't you know, in, in, in his view. But, I, you know, you just hear countless stories about Bergoglio being just an incredibly reckless and irresponsible guy. He's the last person who should have ever been made pope. He shouldn't have even been made, frankly. And I don't even think he's a Catholic. I think if the, 
if the Cardinals were to confront him and put him to the test and really force him to answer questions about the doobie and other matters, it would come out that he's a formal heretic. George, you're down there in Buenos Aires specifically to, uh, you know, go on the street, sort of get a, you know, a, a atmosphere of how things were when Bergoglio, when uh, uh, Archbishop Bergoglio was there. Uh, but there's also a trial going on that is kind of sweeps up some of the papacy and that. Just elaborate on all that for us if you can. Yeah, the um, yeah, there is a trial, as you said, going on involving these poor deaf children who were abused by priests in Argentina. And it, it could, the trial could end up implicating the Pope. But I, I have to say that I do not know the details of the trial. The trial, as I understand it, has been suspended. And it, I don't know when it's going to resume. Uh, one thing I can tell you, though, that, you know, and this is something you hear all over the place in Buenos Aires, which is that Bergoglio, as the archbishop, had a very nasty modus operandi. Namely, he would use his intervention uh, in these cases. He would often um, intervene to help bad priests or to help accused priests. You know, he would, he, would, he would call up tribunals and basically tell the guys on the tribunal, hey, I, I, I want you to shut down your investigation. And then he would use that intervention uh, as a form of leverage over the accused priests. He would, he would call them up and, and say, hey, I, I saved you from this investigation. I expect total obedience from you from now on. And he would get it. And uh, that was one of the, the well, it was one of the ways he preserved his power and enhanced his power. And it's probably and it's 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 a nasty management uh, um, practice, I guess you'd call it, that he's brought with him to the Vatican. You know, people wonder why are so many con men and crooks and degenerates and pederasts why are they part of the Pope's inner circle? And the reason is that uh, the Pope likes it that way. He can use their secrets as a way to control them and get them to do his bidding and, and turn them into very loyal lieutenants. Well, let me ask you that we have something of an example, at least that's what people are saying when he uh, appointed Monsignor Rica uh, to be the head of the Vatican Bank. Remember, that was the whole, that was that particular case that, that brought about the who am I to judge comment on the plane, which of course went all over the world and became kind of the the motto, if you want to call it that, the motto of this papacy. But I mean, Monsignor Rica was, you know, had quite, quite the, um, how shall we say, uh, savory past. And uh, it, all the journalists on the plane knew about it, uh, which is why they popped the question to the Pope. I mean, is this, is that an example of what we're talking about here? Yeah, that's a, that's a great example. Yeah, everything that Sandro Magister reported about Rica, that he had been you know, pulled out of an elevator with a rent boy by fireman. He was, you know, supposedly trapped in the elevator, and they had to they had to fish him out of the elevator. You know, and he was with a, a underage prostitute, male prostitute. Um, all that stuff that Magister and others reported about Rika apparently uh, was true, and the Pope knew it. He knew all of this, you know, and, and yet he still made him the ecclesiastical head of the Vatican Bank. And in fact, in the last three weeks. He uh, gave him even more power. He strengthened his position at the bank, and um, and so why why does he do this? Why does this pope like bad priests so much, and why does he dislike Orthodox priests so much? You know, he's always bad mouthing Orthodox priests. He's calling them neurotics, rigid, pharisaical. He he does not like Orthodox priests, but he has a special place in his heart for priests who break their vows. And I one of the explanations for that is that it's it's so much easier to control a uh, scandal-ridden priest than it is to control a holy orthodox priest who who can't be embarrassed, who can't be blackmailed. Yeah, the, they live exemplary lives. There's nothing to blackmail. There's no material. Yeah. The, well, I want to ask you, because, you know, we see a lot of this kind of behavior of the cover-up and the you know, the idea of actually using the guys, the guy in charge, in this case, the Pope, the example, but I mean, you know, you could say this could relate to any diocese in the country, uh, you know, where you've got a bad, a morally corrupt bishop in place. We hear this constantly, as you know, that they're around them is this sort of cadre of kind of despicable men who happen to be ordained or even consecrated as auxiliary bishops. Is this sort of the... Uh, the MO of how the church is operating as an institution today, do you think? Yeah, it's that standard operating procedure. A bad, a bad bishop will be appointed to some place, and he'll immediately surround himself with degenerates and crooks. And then, um, and then those people will then, you know, self-select. You know, they'll, 
they'll select equally bad men to enter the, the priesthood. And you just have a, a problem. You then have a, 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 a level of dysfunction that is just impossible to correct. And uh, unless you, you know, the, the, as the saying goes, the fish rots from the head down. And so if right. the head of the, if the top of the church is corrupt as hell, and it is, let, let's not kid ourselves. The corruption in the church goes to the very top. It's, it's, it's all around Pope Francis, and it's in Pope Francis. Pope Francis uh, is corrupt. You know, he, he has knowingly protected pederasts and molesters like Theodore McCarrick. We know that for a fact. That's not a matter of speculation. We know, we know from Vigano, Archbishop Vigano, that, that he was told about McCarrick, and he, he simply did not care about that information, and he made McCarrick a player in the church again, knowing full well that McCarrick was was a deeply dangerous uh, prelate. So, um, yeah, so the corruption, and until the corruption at the top of the church is addressed, until the, the rotting head of the church is replaced, uh, I really, we don't, you know, all of our victories are going to be partial, and they're going to be posthumous. You know, we can do what we can at the local level, and maybe at the level of our national, at the church at the national level, but it's very hard to clean up the global Catholic Church as long as you have a corrupt pope, and we do have a corrupt pope. Wait, do you think that's the most pressing problem in the church right now? I mean, you know, Jorge Bergoglio came out of a system. He didn't drop out of the sky. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, so even if even if we were to remove him, what hope? To, let, let's just let's speculate for a moment. Let's say Cardinal Burke or Cardinal uh, Seurat steps out on the logia, on the logia, the you know the next conclave. How much of a uh, solution would that be? I mean, is it unreasonable to think that one of the, one of these men is Pope? You know, he's going to be fought. I mean, they're in their seventies. They're going to be fought tooth and nail every step of the way. Uh, uh, I, I think a lot of people sort of have this narrow thing. Oh, the Pope's the problem. And, you know, not saying he's, there, there's nothing problematic there, but, you know, we had John Paul in as Pope. He's a saint now. We had Benedict in and these things proliferated under them. So, is the solution really just, you know, get rid of the Pope and, you know, swap out Popes and get yeah. a good man in there as a Pope and things are cool? Yeah, now, yeah, obviously it's not a comprehensive solution. The, the, the solution, the ultimate solution is, is, uh, is cutting out the cancer that is racking, uh, you know, that is racking the body of Christ. And that cancer is modernism. And it, it, modernism and the gay mafia are one and the same thing. Uh, gay mm -hmm. mafia is a symptom of the cancer of modernism, and um, the chemotherapy. You know, maybe maybe getting Cardinal Seurat to be the Pope. That's the form of chemotherapy that'll kill maybe tw ten percent of the cancer or twenty percent of the cancer. Mm -hmm. But which isn't nothing. <laughs> which is nothing. Yeah. But basically, yeah, we'd be back in the same situation that we were under John Paul II and Benedict the Sixteenth, which is much better than our current situation. But yeah, the problem of modernism, the cancer of modernism, would continue to spread, and so there has to be a comprehensive uh, surgery performed on the body of Christ, and that that will require years and years of conversion of hearts and minds, and uh, that is something that we, I, I'd like to think that we've begun that work, and that everything that we're doing it aims at um, accomplishing that end, but, you know, this is... The cancer is going to be uh, in the body of Christ for, for probably decades to come. And we yeah, have I, to we have to try to, you know, uh, I know I'm I know I'm extending this analogy absurd in an absurdly long fashion, but we have to save as many cells in the body as possible. And and we can do that at the local level by confronting bad pastors, bad priests, corrupt bishops. And that's not it's not nothing to it's better to do something than nothing. It's better to save, you know, one soul than than no souls at all. So uh, it's better to, you know, strike a blow for the truth at the local and national level where possible, because that I think uh, not only does good in the immediate instant, uh, but it also lays the groundwork for future reformers. Well, yeah, I think that's the point. I mean, you know, you have to look at this at some point and say, uh, it, it, you know, this is a hundred plus year old problem manifest for a hundred years. Uh, you know, obviously had taken root long before that. Uh, but you, here you are. Uh, what are we doing? We're laying the foundations for the uh, sort of the restoration cathedral 
that none of us will be alive to see the steeples go up on. We just won't. And that's fine as long as we were able to participate and, you know, merit something towards our salvation by this kind of work. I, I, I think it's incredible. And speaking of that work, <clears throat> you, we, and a number of other, you know, very good, solid reporting uh, apostolates and individuals have all of a sudden in the last month, two months, kind of become the targets of a flurry of attacks and false charges and half-truths and everything else by Catholic establishment media and Catholic leftist media like American Magazine or uh, you know National Catholic Reporter. Uh, and they've never really liked any of us, of course, because they're all part of the evil empire that runs that whole show and allows it to continue. However, the bluntness of the attacks and the sort, I'd even say to some degree, the ferocity of the attacks and now the, the uh, almost the propaganda war against independent Catholic media types, uh, I, I think really says something about being over the target. What are your thoughts? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We, we should take it as a compliment. The attacks grow in proportion to the effectiveness of independent Catholic media. So the more effective we are, the more they're going to attack us. So I think, yeah, I, I take it as a good sign when I'm attacked by prominent liberals. It means that I've, I've really uh, landed some punches. And, you know, because they're not going to go after people who are irrelevant. They only go after people who are relevant, who are effective. And so, um, you know, we should continue, you know, and, and the attacks are usually so lame and that they end up revealing uh, how weak uh, the Catholic left is and, and what a, what a, um, uh, a uh, paper tiger the Catholic left is. You know, you, it, you know, we, we should not be intimidated in any way by the Catholic, the establishment Catholic media, by Catholic academia, by the Catholic hierarchy, because these guys are, are wimps, and a lot of them are fools. They don't know very much. They're obviously con men. They're pretending to be Catholic when they're not. They're trying to hijack, or they have hijacked an institution to a certain extent, and we need to reclaim that institution, that church. For God, because it doesn't belong to these these crooks and con men and degenerates. It belongs to Jesus Christ. It's His church, Absolutely. and God. Amen. I think God expects us. Jesus Christ expects us to fight for His church and to and to prevent His church from falling into the hands of, of corrupt men. And if we don't do that, if we don't serve as His hands, His fists, as it were, if we don't fight. I think we're going to have a lot to answer for on Judgment Day, as Vigano said, and that's why Vigano is doing what he's doing. He doesn't want to have to appear before God on Judgment Day and have to answer the question, "Why the hell didn't you do something when you, when my church was under attack from within?" Yeah, no, well, well put, well put, George. We're going to wrap up unless you've got any other, uh, which you always do. <laughs> have any uh, you know other wonderful insights? You know, look, Catholics need some reinforcement in this. We need some. You know, some, you know, uh, you know, shots in the arm and, you know, kicks in the pants to sup and sap and say, you know, this is what's going on and we need to do it. Any more words of wisdom before we uh, tune out for now? Well, I, I just think that, um, you know, uh, you've shown the way. I think Church Militant has really shown the way in this that we have to put points on the board. You know, we have to be effective. Charity is measured by effectiveness. The more effective you are, the more it shows that you care. And that you're you're taking you know that you're that you really love the church. So we should everything we should do, we should be aiming at effectiveness at, at effectively changing the church for the better. Amen, amen. George, coming to us from Buenos Aires, uh, safe home. You're back in a couple of days, right? I'll be back in a few days. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right. Well, you make sure you take care. Keep keep looking over your shoulder. You know, you don't talk about this stuff, and you know, no nobody of the bad guys pay attention. Of course, they pay attention. <laughs> well, I, I'm in no danger of Monsignor Rossi uh, coming after me down here, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've got a I've got a line I could say, but I I won't say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe he's got uh, some priest friends down here too. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll we'll leave it at that. <laughs> George, thanks very much for joining us. Appreciate it, man. God bless. You too. Thank you for having me.